How's everyone doing this afternoon? Looks like a good, excited crowd. I want to welcome you all to Manuel's Tavern. My name is Tim Carroll. I'm the president of Georgia for Democracy. Um, before Georgia for Democracy, we were known as Georgia for Dean back in 2003. Uh, one of the first states to go up during the presidential primary campaign back in 2003, and we're very proud of that and glad to see the work continuing. So uh, to kick things off, I just want to do a little bit of a, a time machine rollback. Um, many of you who are, anybody else C-SPAN junkies in the room? You uh, are one of those strange people like me that watch, watch C-SPAN at all hours of the day. In 2003, uh, many of us were watching the DNC winter meeting in Washington, D.C., and we saw a governor from a small New England state get up and ask some questions about why things weren't being done. I believe the phrase was, I, what I want to know is. And he asked about things like uh, why we were getting involved in Iraq, why there were so many millions of uh, Americans without health care. Asked some big questions that no one in the field was asking at that time. And he energized uh, a lot of volunteers that were hungry and angry and wanted to see something done. Uh, and we all came out and worked uh, for this man to be the next president of the United States. Many of you in this room uh, were part of that group. I see a lot of familiar faces. Um, so I don't think it's any surprise uh, that those themes continued not only through that presidential campaign, uh, but also for the DNC chairmanship race. Uh, and again, when the 2008 presidential campaign started, we heard those same central core uh, issues coming back again. Health care, getting us out of Iraq. Um, and there was one man that I would like to think uh, kind of started that ball rolling, um, and that man was Governor Howard Dean. We're really happy and glad to have you back in Georgia. We're glad that you came to our state so many times during your campaign um, and uh, probably helped us be a little more in the spotlight for this last presidential campaign, and you're to be thanked for that. Ladies and gentlemen, Governor Howard Dean. Thank you very much. I'm not as tall as Tim, so I'm going to stand up here so everybody can see me. I, uh, it, it's great to be back in Georgia. Um, uh, it was great coming to Georgia all those times. You know, this is not a, such a red state as everybody thinks it is. And um, when, when, uh, when uh, after President Obama got the nomination, I uh, was dispatched on a bus tour to states that people, uh, that he thought we could win, but nobody else would. And it was fun. We started in Crawford, Texas just uh, <laughs> by coincidence. And uh, we went through Louisiana, which is a little tougher. And then we you know, eventually got through Georgia, and I was down in Savannah and Atlanta. It was pretty good. And um, you know, we didn't win here, but we're going to try next time. And um, so thank you all very much for all of that. Uh, let me talk a little bit about the health care, what's in the book. The reason I wrote the book is because um, one of the things that I, I do know how to do, for the most part, is um, try to make complicated subjects explainable in plain English. And I can't think of a more complicated, difficult uh, subject than healthcare. It is, not only is it complicated, but people tend to lapse into acronyms that nobody knows what they mean, including me. So I, I wanted to write a book in plain English that everybody could understand that what was at stake in healthcare reform, who's standing in the way, why it hasn't happened so far, what's the history of it. And the basic thesis of the book is the reason I happen to believe that the president's health care reform bill is the best bill I've seen. Not because it's perfect, it's not, but because it can pass and it ought to pass. The fundamental dynamic of why we haven't had health in, real health care reform in this country for 60 years, <coughs> with the exception of Lyndon Johnson, who at least brought it to people over 65, which is a major achievement. The, the real reason is because we start in a very different place than the countries that do have it. And what the, what the president has figured out is that it's easy to beat something uh, by raising questions and causing fear. 80% of the people in this country have health insurance, and 70% of them have pretty decent health insurance. So in a democracy, 70% always beats 30%. So you're not going to win by talking simply about the plight of the uninsured. We know that's the right thing to do to insure everybody, but that's not how you win. The way you win is to explain to the 70% of the people that have something what's going to go wrong if we don't change. And they know that, especially during this recession. I talked to a lady when I came in the door who was paying $25,000 a year for a small businesses for her, her and her two employees. And that's ridiculous. What, you know, small businesses create 80% of all the new jobs in America. 
and we're charging them $25,000 for four employees, individuals, not even with the families. It is three employees because one of them's covered by somebody else. I mean, this can't go on. We're not just losing jobs to China, we're losing jobs to Canada because their businesses don't have to pay for health care for their employees. Yeah, they pay a little higher taxes, but the taxes don't go up at three times the rate of inflation the way health insurance does here. So our health care system is an economic disaster waiting to happen and starting to happen now, and we have to fix it. And the central theme of the book is we need to fix it by giving the American people the choice of what kind of health insurance they want and not have that choice made for them by politicians, bureaucrats, and the health insurance industry. You know, the health insurance industry gets a pretty good deal. Medicare, which is a single payer, which we've had in this country for 45 years, uh, spends 4% of every dollar on administration. That is, if you're, you're paying money into Medicare, either your premiums or your uh, taxes, and only four cents out of every dollar you put in there goes to administration, everything else goes to health care. The best, most effective nonprofit insurer is about 12%. And the, for the for-profit insurer, the very best, is about 20%. 20% of the money that you pay stays in administration. 80% goes to health care. Some of them take 50% of your dollars, and it goes into something other than health care. That is not an efficient system. That means we, ha we think it's great that Republicans are out there working really hard for a system that takes at least 20% of every dollar you put in and does something else with it other than health care. That makes no sense whatsoever. Now... We're not going to change the whole system overnight because we now know, having tried this three times, that you've got to have some answers for the people who like what they have. You know, health care is a little like Congress. Everybody says they hate Congress, but they keep reelecting their Congress people. Well, everybody says they hate the health care system because it's so expensive, but they, keep, they like their doctor and they like the kind of care they get if they have decent insurance. So the cry to beating health care reform has always been watch out. And, you know, the Republicans are trying to get socialized medicine is around the corner, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. Rationing is coming and all this business. So what the president has said, which I like so much, is if you like what you have, you can keep it. If you like what you have, you can keep it. But if you want something different, there will be a choice that you will be able to make, not your employer, not the Congress, and not the health insurance industry. You can choose a public health insurance option that's run by the government which coincidentally will be cheaper and will cost uh, and, and will put 96% of all your premium dollars into health care and not 80% or less. That's the basic thesis of this. Is it a perfect plan? No. Uh, I already said a single payer would be much more efficient. But then the Republicans and the health insurance industry would put on another Harry Louise campaign claiming this stuff and that stuff and other stuff. So. Let people choose whether they personally want to have a single payer or they personally want to have something else. Let them vote with their feet. And that's the central thesis of the book. The book goes through a lot of the, uh, of the where, whys and wherefore of what the real problems in healthcare are without dwelling on it. I, didn't, I put some stories in for about the, some of the tragedies that people have, but not a lot of them because I think we all personally have those tragedies in, in our lives and in other people's lives that we know well. The real point of this thing was to make the case for the American people that without a public option, this is not health insurance reform and we shouldn't spend a dime on it. You can do insurance reform. We did when I was governor in Vermont. We have guaranteed issue in community rating. Guaranteed issue means you cannot be turned down for any pre-existing condition. You cannot lose your insurance because you get sick, which is a favorite tactic of insurance companies. Uh, and so you're guaranteed to be able to buy health insurance in my state as long as you can pay. And community rating means they can't charge you more 20, more than 20% above their base rate for their cheapest patient. So if you're 60 years old and you have 15 long-term medical problems, they can't charge you 20%, more than 20% above what they charge the cheapest patient who might be 25 and perfectly healthy. That's th those two things are important. And so if the Congress doesn't want to pass a public option, don't give us all this mumbo-jumbo about co-ops and, uh, you know, trigger mechanisms and all this hocus-pocus. Just don't bother. Just give us... Guaranteed options, community rating, that'll at least get the insurance companies to behave a little bit better. And then we'll elect some people who do. Because remember, uh, change we can believe in? Well, we can still have more change if we don't get the change that we can believe in. And I'm not kidding about that. Look, I'm proud of all the work we did electing Democrats to this White House and the Senate and the, and the House and all that. But we meant to elect real Democrats to the White House and the Senate, right? And so 
you know, we can still change some more, and we're going to be looking at that. I, I am very proud of being a Democrat, but I'm not a Democrat just because I think somebody has Democrat after their name. That automatically makes, automatically makes them great at whatever they do. I'm a Democrat because Democrats can get stuff done and bring the kind of change we need to America. And if we elect a bunch of people that don't do that, I really don't care what they call themselves. It's time for some more change. So that's where we are. Um, I really appreciate it. This is a great crowd uh, on a, uh, in an afternoon, on a Friday afternoon, when I know you could be doing uh, something that would probably be more fun than coming to a book signing. But I really appreciate it, and I am happy in the true tradition of democracy for America for your comments, questions, and rude remarks if necessary. <laughs> as long as they're under a minute. Did I do okay? <laughs> All right, so we'll do this in the very um, backwards way. Uh, we're going to start from the back of the room and work front, so if you have questions, please raise your hand. We're going to go here. Who else? You and got here in the way, orange way shirt back too. and here in the gray shirt. So let's start with you. Uh, Governor Dean, good to have you back in Georgia. Thank you. Big for a long time. Uh, and your 50-state strategy was critical to electing Democrats. Yeah. Yeah. We were happy to do it. Happy to do it. Not just giving you a nice Democratic governor. I know there's one coming up here someplace. <laughs> Well, um, in this day and age, I wouldn't normally answer this question this way, but there's actually a book out that tells you all that stuff. <laughs> and it's right here. No, I'm serious about this. I wrote this book with two guys. You're going to see the name Faz Shakir and uh, Igor Volsky on the front page of the book. They were my co-authors. They're both young guys from the um, Center for American Progress, and they are real policy wonks. And they are great, and there's a lot of stuff in here. There's a whole section, uh, uh, many of you obviously know something about health care policy and follow it. There's a guy named Frank Luntz, who is a well-known Republican kind of, uh, I guess, uh, spinmeister, I guess you'd call him, who, has, who feeds the Republicans things to say about the bill that mostly aren't true but are scary. So in here, there's a whole chapter called Myths. And you can get the eight myths from Frank Luntz that the Republicans are always, or the 11, I think it is, that are, they're always going to say, and here's the counter-argument. No, it's not true that there's rationing in Canada. No, it's not true that et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. No, it's not true that jobs are going to leave America. In fact, we're going to have some more jobs here if we do this the right way. So that's the first thing. The second thing is um, a lot of the arguments and the numbers are in here, and they're not just some guy like me who's an advocate. These are people who, they do this for a living. Um, and... My role was kind of, I kind of wrote the book, and then they rewrote stuff where it needed backup, where they needed references, where they needed um, specific figures. The figures in here are absolutely uh, gold-plated, and so you, you can, they weren't, you know, invented by me for the purposes of pushing some argument. They're stuff that, that really smart researchers uh, have gotten there. So I, I, I don't mean to be a total shill for my book, although I guess I'm allowed to because this is a book signing event. <laughs> but that, I, I, before, I, 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 you can go to a website if you want, and there are some. But, and this is also in here is a list of stuff you can do. Now that you can go, also go with, uh, there's a website Democracy for America put up called standwithdrdean.com. It wasn't my idea, but that's what they wanted to call it. And, um, you know, here's what I would do. First of all, um, I don't think it would hurt any in Georgia, where most of the congressional delegation and the senators are against a public option, to let them know that. I, I think they've probably long uh, given up on uh, paying any attention to anybody from inside Atlanta, the Beltway in Atlanta. But um, let them know that. Email them. Lots of emails. Get your friends to email. Get your aunts and uncles from Iowa to email. Get lots of people to email. That's a good thing. Um, let them know. Uh, that, you, that you expect them to stand up for real health care reform, and who do they think they are? Remember, 72% of all the American people believe that they should have the choice of whether they're going to have private or public health insurance, and more than 50% of all the Republicans in, among Americans believe that they should have the choice between signing up for a public or a private option. These guys are not doing the people's business. They are doing the right-wing ideologue's business. This is not based 
on any kind of reasonable, thoughtful argument. It's, it is based on something that they, some kind of basically crackpot economic theory, which has been fortunately in vogue for the last eight years. Well, it's not in vogue anymore. We just got to get, get some folks out of the idea that it's okay to not pay any attention to 72% of the American people. So that's one figure you remember. 72% of the American people think there ought to be a choice and that the American public should be able to make it for themselves as individuals. And more than 50% of Republicans think that they ought to have the choice uh, between a private or a public plan. Anyway, that stuff is all in here. And, you can all, and if you want a long list of stuff, you can do emailing. Uh, if you want to influence particular senators, there's a great Bill Press has a great website up on his show. I don't know what it's called, probably BillPress.com. He does a radio show in the morning. On it has the email address of all the Democrats that are, haven't come out in favor of this. No harm in emailing them. Uh, I wouldn't do phone calls and letters to the people outside your state because I don't think most people pay attention to them. But if you have relatives in places like Montana or Delaware or Indiana, it doesn't hurt to call up your relatives and say, hey, you know, your guy's not in favor of this. Why don't you let him know that he really needs to be in favor? Because they will pay attention if it's in state. That's the one thing people care about more about than money in Washington is, is getting reelected. And they can't do that unless uh, they do stuff that the voters want them to. Uh, the, the, in the bill, which I think has been mostly agreed to by everybody except the Republicans, who fortunately don't have enough clout to stop this, is guaranteed issue and community rating for everybody. That will prevent the, public, uh, the private plan from cherry picking. They'll have to take anybody who wants to sign up with them. That'll be the law, the insurance law. That just as it is in Vermont, that, that law essentially will be the law for the whole uh, country. Uh, I share your concerns about the so-called, I won't use the word you used because I'm on, apparently on some kind of television here, but um, we, not that that ever stopped me before. <laughs> but um, I, I, I spent some time in the book talking about the fake public option. The fake public option is a trigger me mechanism. For example, a public option that will kick in if the, if the uh, insurance companies don't do such and such. Well, that's a ridiculous idea. They'll just wait till the date passes, and then they'll go back to doing such and such. That was tried during the inflation fighting years in the, in the 80s. Um, another fake public option is the so-called co-op idea, which is run by nonprofits. We had those. It was called Blue Cross Blue Shield, and they all got run over by the private insurance business, which mostly took them over. Uh, or, uh, you know, and so uh, those are not the things that, that, that's not a real public option. We don't want to plan like that. Um, as I said before, we do have a single payer in this country for those over 65, but it has private insurance in it. It's very hard to really define a, a single payer. Most people think that Canada and Britain have a single payer. I think most people would agree on that. 15% of all the dollars in the system in Britain, which is probably the most socialized system in the Western world, uh, are private dollars. So it's kind of hard to say what really is a single payer. One could argue that the public option, and the Republicans claim that the, that the public option is a single payer. So what? So what? Uh, let people, let the individuals make their own choice about that. But the converse is, it's, it's, if I'm arguing that, and, and this is the argument, the argument is we're not for this but any particular system except it has to have a public option because we know it won't work, the cost controls won't work without one. But the, if the argument is about letting the American people choose, which is a very popular argument, as I just said, even Republicans think the American people ought to choose, not politicians and insurance companies. So if that's what the argument is, it's very hard to then turn around and say, but we will choose a single payer for you any more than it is we will choose a private sector for you. So I'm not against a single payer system. I'm not. And we may end up with one someday. Uh, but this plan 
uh, is gives individuals a choice between they, whether they want to be enrolled in something like Medicare, which is a single payer now, or whether they don't. And I think that choice belongs with the individual people right now, not Congress. Well, that's, that's a great question, and that's why the public option is necessary, because the private sector has been totally incapable of controlling costs. They've been there for 60 years. I mean, that's what makes me laugh so much about the people who oppose the public option. It, it's really about the, their philosophy is, if we keep doing the same thing, we'll eventually get a different result. It makes no sense whatsoever. So it's time to try something different. Here's, the, here's why I think the public option will reduce costs fairly significantly. And let me answer your first question right up front. The rates that we compensate primary care physicians are going to have to go up under the public option. Now, we, when we did this, we, ha we used a, a very big, thanks to Bill Clinton, expansion of Medicaid, which I got a waiver for when I was governor, to essentially ensure every child in my state, everybody in, in Vermont, 99% of all our kids are eligible for health insurance, 96% have it. And that's not all public health insurance, some of it's in the private sector, but they all have it and they're all covered. In order to get that done, we had to raise the rate for reimbursement of pediatricians. Because if 80 per 60 or 70 percent of their practice is, is, uh, is Medicaid, they, they can't live, and they can't, they can't keep their practice going. And literally, with the rates that Medicaid paid at that time, literally it would cost them money every time they saw a Medicaid patient. You can't do that. On the other hand, there are a lot of ways of reducing costs. One is to stop paying people, paying physicians and providers fee for service. Uh, you know, the, and, this, and, and doctors used to be horrified by this. Instead of paying, if you, if you pay somebody by the procedures, guess what? You're going to get a lot more procedures. We do three times as many coronary artery bypass grafts in the United States of America than they do in Canada. The mortality from heart disease ad, ad, adjusted for demographics is about the same. Uh, colonoscopies, we do a lot of them. It's good. We don't want to get people not to do colonoscopies. It's not all that pleasant, certainly to discuss anyway. They give you so many drugs you, when you have one. It's not so bad. I can attest to that. I had my first one not too long ago. Uh, but, but they're expensive, and, and therefore there's a lot of revenue. If you, now, this is the interesting thing about it, what's changed. The average primary care doctor in the United States of America today gets paid less than the average primary care doctor in Britain. This, isn't this interesting? You, you, people think that, now the national health insurance system in Britain spends a little less than half of what we spend, a little less than half of what we spend in terms of their gross national product. How is it that their doctors are all on salary, their primary care doctors get paid more than ours? Well, one is that the pound used to be higher, so maybe it's a little lower now, but, but the fact is, they're all on salary, and there's no incentive to do more stuff than is necessary. So that's a big deal. The second thing is, in the private sector, we really ought to work very hard at integrating health care systems. Let me explain this for a minute, because it's a complicated subject, and I don't want to make it too, take up all the time in this one question. I met some guys in San Diego who are high-tech people, and they had invented this machine that was a little strip. It's an electronic strip. It's like a Band-Aid, and they can put it on you, and it will send over Wi-Fi to your doctor's office your blood pressure and your blood sugar and your sodium and your potassium, stuff like that. And basically, the, the point of it is they can monitor a couple of chronic diseases, diabetes and congestive heart failure, uh, from afar. And be they believe, and they're now doing randomized clinical trial with the NIH, that ultimately this will result in, for people who, who have long-term, these kinds of long-term chronic illnesses, maybe reducing hospital costs because those kinds of people have between one and two intensive care unit visits per year. Let's just suppose that costs $40,000, which is probably a low figure for an ICU visit, okay? So if you have two ICU visits in a year, that's $80,000. And you could prevent that if you could see from home that somebody's sugar was going up to a point where you knew they were going to get in trouble or their fluid status was out of whack, and you could get them come right to your office and call them up before things got too so far down the line they were ended up in the back of an ambulance. So why don't we all go out and buy this 
this $3,000 hit. Because the way the healthcare system is set up right now, the people who are paying the $3,000 for the monitoring equipment never get their money back. Because if I'm the primary care doctor, I don't get anything from the $3,000, and the hospital sees the $80,000 that is saved as revenue that they lose, because they only get money if somebody comes in and fills in the intensive care. You know, the only company that I know of off the top of my head, there are probably some others that makes money on something like this, is Kaiser. Because Kaiser, a nonprofit system, I might add, which is a great way of getting health care, Kaiser has primary care doctors and intensive care, so, and they're an insurance company at the same time. So if you go to Kaiser, it pays them to buy these $3,000 electronic strips and the Wi-Fi to keep you out of trouble because they know at the other end they're going to have to pay for the $80,000 uh, hotel bill, and that's, I mean, uh, hospital bill, and that's a savings for them. So the whole incentive system in our healthcare system is wrong, and my argument about the public system is it's the only potential way of integrating the system so that investment in prevention is actually pays off. Everybody agrees that we should invest in prevention, and it never happens. And why does it never happen? Because the people who have to pay the money to invest in prevention are never the people that end up saving it. And we've got to change the system. And having a public option, and lots of people in the public option, maybe even everybody if they choose, is the way to integrate the system to make sure that it pays to invest in preventive uh, stuff and not just the high-end stuff at the end. That was a very long answer. I'll try not to do that again, but it was also an incredibly complicated question. All right, let's come to this side of the room. We've got one back here. Who else has a question? And right here in front. So we'll start with you. Uh, someone always gets Yeah, I do, and that's a great question, but now is a great time. This is why it's so important to do health insurance now, this year. I think the president's right when he says it's got to be done this year. It's not going to pass at all. We've just seen that government has just saved this country. It, with the banking crisis, if government hadn't done what they do, I, I love the Republicans complaining that the stimulus package wasn't big enough or wasn't thought that. Why, you know why it was $707 million? Billion? Because the Republicans made us cut it $200 billion. They wouldn't let it out of the Senate. I mean, this is ridiculous. Uh, there's one group of people who deserve to be demonized, and it begins with an R, but... <laughs> Not the moderate, thoughtful ones. There may still be some left that haven't been driven out by the right-wing ideologues. Um, but, I mean, the bottom line is, we've just, America has just experienced a time where government was, really was an incredible help, and they know it. Uh, so we've got to get this done quickly while, we don't, while the people understand what the government has done. The other thing, I think we've got, we've got to stop pussyfooting around. When the Democratic Party start, sounds like the Republican Party on the issue of government, then we lose. We, we, the, way, the reason that the Republicans get to demonize people is nobody stands up and gives them the other side. The fact of the matter is this. The private sector does most things more efficiently. There are two things that I can think of off the top of my head that it doesn't. One is health care, and the other is defense. And we have seen firsthand in Iraq what happens when you privatize the defense of the United States of America. It is an enormous waste of money, and there's a hell of a lot of money that disappears and never is accounted for again. So we can make a pretty good case that, in fact, government is not the enemy. It's, it's people who come in and rip off government and take our taxpayers' money and misuse it, uh, as, as they did when the, president, uh, the, uh, the former president pri essentially privatized our military operations. So... You know, that's a, it's a reasonable battle. We shouldn't shirk from our end of the battle. I don't think government is the answer, but it sure as hell isn't the problem either. And we ought to be able to defend government when government works and criticize government when it doesn't work and stand up for that principle because if we let it get, go too far and give in on that one, I heard a lot of Democrats badmouth government. I think that's a big mistake. Uh, we are the party of government, and the government always works better when we run it because we believe in it. Uh, and so I think we ought to say that and be proud of it. And if people want to vote on that issue, let's at least give our side of the story. Um, if there is a public option, are you for mandatory participation to the end 
That's a really interesting question. Am I for a mandatory participation, a mandate, a so-called mandate? Um, I, I make the argument in the book that you don't really have to have one. Um, but I don't, my feeling about this is so strongly that we have to have a public option that I really don't get into too many other deal, details. I disagree with the president on how to fund it. I think we ought to fund it with a carbon tax, and I make the case for that in the book as well. It's much easier to account for, you don't, and it helps the environment. And the people who get hurt by a carbon tax, which I never supported when I was governor, because it's always the people, the poorest working people who have to drive a long way because they can't afford houses where their jobs are. But they're, of course, of course they're statistically the ones that benefit by far the most by now having health insurance that can't be taken away. But in terms of the mandate, I come down slightly against it, but again, I would never fight the plan because of anything else other than the lack of a real public option, because I just want that. But that's so essential to the working of the plan that I think the rest of the details, I'm reasonably happy to leave up to the people who are writing the bill. Um, and the reason I, I would particularly say that I don't think a mandate is that critical is that I think Obama's arguments during the campaign were right. Most people don't choose not to get health insurance because they can't, not because they don't want to. And if you make it reasonably affordable, then it will be. The exception to that is people who are under the age of 30 or 25. And what I said in the book, and some people think this is what I'm advocating, it's not what I'm advocating. If I could have a perfect world, this is what I would do. I would treat people under 30 the way the Canadians do it. You, you get born here, you get naturalized here, you just get a card, and then you get health care, and I'd give it away for free. And that's against actually what I believe. I think you ought to have co-payments and some personal responsibility. The trouble is if you mandate health insurance and give a voucher to somebody who's 25 years old, they'll get a Harley before they'll get health insurance, <laughs> and they just aren't going to do it. And, and they never think anything bad is going to happen to them. And the truth is only two bad things statistically do happen. Either you get a malignancy, which is unusual, or you get an accident, which is, which is less than, I mean, it's, 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 it's more usual, but it's not, you know, it's, it's not an everyday occurrence. Those are the two really expensive things that happen to you if you're under 30. Taking care of people under 30 is so cheap that it almost doesn't pay to go through the same rigmarole of co-payments and deductibles and everything else. Uh, for the, just give them the insurance, and they, then that's the biggest portion of the people that you have to worry about not being in the system. If you're over 30, especially if you have kids or a family, you're going to get health insurance. It's the responsible thing to do. Uh, you care deeply about your children. You care about yourself because you know if something happens to you, you can't provide for them. And I, I think the number of people who would, who would free ride, as they call it, is far, far less than 1%. I, if, you, if you want a mandate, I don't feel terrible about that either, but I, if I were designing the system, I, I probably wouldn't do it. All right, so the, the governor has time to sign books. We're going to take two more questions. Was there anybody that's kind of behind my line of vision that had a question? I didn't get to see your hand. Or over here on the left. Okay. Um, all the way in the back in the striped shirt right here. We'll start with you. And then I'm going to come back down to the front. So you first. Okay, the next person has to be a female. I've just been pointed out that no women are going to ask questions. Fair enough. All right. Sorry, right, go ahead. Go ahead. Well, the price tag on the whole plan, as scored by CBO, is a trillion dollars over 10 years. That's $100 billion a year, which is not, in the big scheme of things, a lot of money. Uh, it is to us. But, uh, but you have to remember that a lot of that money is already in the system. For example, one of the things in the President's plan, which I love, is that small businesses will no longer have a responsibility for paying for health insurance. That will be between the government, to, depending on their income, and the individuals themselves. So. Small businesses create 80% of all the new jobs in America. Here we are with the worst unemployment rate that we've seen since the 1980s. And we need small business because they create 80% of all the new jobs. So why shouldn't we do something for small business? Why don't we take the burden of health insurance off them? Yeah. And so that's, instead of a trillion new dollars, that's money that we are saying to the small business community, you can reinvest this in what you want and we'll take over this responsibility. So that's not really new Dollars. It is government dollars. It's new government dollars, but it's saving other people in the system uh, elsewhere. And there's a lot of that going on. For example, uncompensated care. If you go to a big county hospital, Grady, is that, is that a public, publicly owned hospital? Okay, you go to Grady, you don't have insurance, uh, the, the county or the state has to pay Grady something for that. Or if, you don't, if they don't, then they just jack up your insurance premiums and you pay it yourself. So you're either paying for that now through your taxes or through your insurance premiums. Well, 
under Obama's system, that's part of the trillion dollars. Now, now those people who go to Grady who have no insurance, they have, they, now they have some insurance. Grady gets paid that way. So is that new money? No. So the idea that the Republicans are saying, well, we've got a trillion dollars, and my God, we're going to bankrupt the country. No, you're not. You're just taking the money and the responsibility from one pocket and putting it in a different pocket, and having some much more rational uh, system uh, than it has been in the past. So the, the CBO price tag is a trillion dollars, but that's not really all new money. It's rearranging the money in a more efficient way. Last question. Margie's got a question. Margie, go ahead. Your last question. Well, let me just. Um, I, I, I think that's true about the insurance companies. I don't think it's true about the drug companies because if you do that to the drug companies, you get there, there's not going to be much innovation anymore, and that's a major problem. So that I, I leave that to the side. Well, I've worked with the nurse for 33 years. Yeah. Oh, I'm with you. You don't have to talk to me about the insurance companies I'm with you on. Um, so look, let me just talk about this for a second. All right. What you say is basically so, that if everybody were on Medicare, it would be a much cheaper system. There would be some problems. The reimbursement for primary care physicians it would be a big problem. Um, but but this, let me just finish, because I let you finish. Um, so here's the difference between what you're suggesting, which is a perfectly rational, thoughtful plan, which may need to be tweaked a little bit, but the fundamentals of it are absolutely solid, and what the president's suggesting. It's a matter of timing. If you said to everybody in America, you're going to sign up for Medicare starting next year, and you'll be on Medicare, there would be a lot of people who don't know a lot about Medicare who'd say, oh, my God, what's the matter with the stuff I got? So what the president is saying is, we will give you a choice, and we'll next year, instead of forcing you to sign up for Medicare, which might be cheaper and might be more efficient, I agree with you on that, we will give you the choice between whether you want to do that or keep what you have. And the reason I like, well, I, we could agree or disagree on that one. I disagree with you on that one. But I think the American people deserve that choice. That's all the president is saying. Let's give, it, it, we need a transition period. Let's suppose for the sake of argument that you were president and we and we're going to switch to the system that you just advocated for, which is not unreasonable. It's essentially the Canadian system, essentially the British system. There's private dollars in there. There's, everybody has in private. There are people who have private insurance in those systems, but it's mostly just the way you described it. The question then is what's the transition period and who should determine what the transition period is? And what the president has decided is the American people as individuals will decide what the transition period is, what's right for them. And I think that's very smart politically, and that's why I like it. So now why don't I sign some books? Thank you.